Okay, in this video, we're going to model a tower inspired by a concept from Zaha Hadid Architects, a fluid, futuristic design originally proposed for Lusail City in Qatar. It's a great example for practicing 3D modeling in Rhino. It has a lot of intricate patterns. Here you can see these wave-like structures flowing from bottom to top, along with some interesting perforated forms. We'll recreate them using a few clean modeling techniques. As always, every command used in the video will appear at the top of the screen, so following along is much easier. If you're new here, this is part of our Rhino Architectural Modeling series, where we model a range of projects to help you improve your modeling skills. Okay, before we start, let's adjust our Rhino preferences to speed up the modeling process. When you first open Rhino, it may look something like this. I've already prepared a theme, shortcut list, and alias list for you. Just download that and then type options import, navigate to the file you downloaded and press open. It will give you a list of settings, just check select all. If you already have any custom aliases or preference settings, you can uncheck the ones you want to keep and then press OK. This will automatically configure your Rhino to look like mine. It already includes preset shortcuts to help you model more efficiently. All right. So let's get started with the tutorial. I'm going to expand our perspective view. In this view, I'll create a polygon. Let's set the number of sides to eight. I'm placing it at the world origin by typing zero and pressing enter. For the radius, hold down shift to align to the x-axis and set it to 11 meters. Select the polygon and type make sub D friendly. Now I'll extrude it by seven meters then scale it up to around 25 meters while holding shift to scale proportionally, then extrude upward by 9 meters and scale it down to about 9 meters, again holding shift. One more extrusion, this time around 26 meters and scale it down to about 12 meters with shift held, then extrude upward by 19 meters followed by a small extrusion with slight proportional scaling. Now we've got our base form, let's modify it a bit. Switch to front view and change to shaded mode. Hold down control and shift, double click on this edge to select the full loop, then press control plus B to bevel. Hold down control and shift, select the other edges and bevel them as well. Holding down control and shift, I'll select a face, double click to grab the full loop, move it down, then hold shift and scale scale it down proportionally. Now I'll select this edge and press Ctrl plus R to add an edge loop. Select it, hold shift and scale it down. I'll apply the same selection method to these faces as well. Hold down shift and scale them down, then move them slightly up or down to adjust the form as needed. Now the base form looks like this. Let's take a look at the reference image. Here we can see wave-like structures, so we'll adjust our edge loops to follow that kind of flow. This is just a repeated structure on each side, so we only need to model one part. The rest will be reflected. I'll switch to top view and set it to shaded so we can see more clearly. Now I'll use the reflect command. Let's say I want to keep this part, make sure the arrow points toward the side you want to keep. The geometry will be reflected to the other side. I'll add a second reflection plane and flip it toward the side I want to keep. In perspective view, you can now see the original geometry with a lighter shade and the reflected side appearing darker. You can see the effect more clearly in render view. When I move this part, the reflection updates automatically. So we only need to model this portion. Now I'll select all the vertical edges lying on the lighter region by holding Ctrl and Shift and double clicking on one of them. I'll zoom in and press Ctrl plus B to apply a small bevel. That gives us some holding edges for the form. From here, our edge loops need to follow the wave pattern. So I'll hold down Ctrl and Shift, select this edge and this one, then use the slide command. In the slide offset options, I'll switch from absolute to proportional. I'll slide this one slightly behind from the midpoint then select the opposite edges and slide that as well until we get small gaps. So now, if you press tab on your keyboard, 
you'll see that the 3D shape doesn't hold very well. I'll hold down Ctrl and Shift, then double click to select the new edge loop we just created. I'll bevel it again using the shortcut Ctrl plus B. Now, if you press Tab again to toggle the Sub-D display, you'll see the shape is holding properly. We're going to push that form a bit more. I'll hold down Control and Shift, select the first face, then double click on the second one to grab the full loop. Once all the faces are selected, I'll type Extrude Sub-D. You can control the extrusion by moving the cursor up or down. I'll set a small amount. Now, if you press Tab, the form becomes more visible. I'll switch to rendered mode so we can see the shape more clearly. In this area, um, the form looks a bit flat. So we're gonna give it some depth. I'll hold down Control and Shift, then double click to select this edge loop. And then I'll press Control plus R to insert a new edge loop. In the options, I'll change the offset to proportional. Now I'll select the new edge loop we just created and type scale 2D. I'll set the center point by typing zero and pressing enter. Then I'll click in this area and drag it down to scale. I'll switch back to rendered mode to see the result more clearly. Adjust the scaling until it looks right. Now we have some variation in the form instead of everything looking flat and straight. That's working well. We're going to apply two different patterns on this sub D. But before we do that, let me show you something. I'll go to the sub D tools section and run the command set sub D face color by face pack. Now you can see that the top and bottom faces have different colors. What does that mean? Let me hold down alt and drag to make a copy, then select the new sub D and run the to NURBS command. If you select the result, you'll see it's a poly surface. That means it's made up of multiple surfaces. If you explode it, you'll see that it's composed of several separate surfaces. If you're planning to use something like lunchbox or a grasshopper pattern, it's better to have a single surface, right? The reason we have different base colors is because those extra surfaces were created during the extrusion steps. If we delete those faces, we'll end up with a single face pack. I'll switch to face selection mode and drag to select those faces. I'll do the same for the bottom ones, and once they're selected, I'll press delete. Now we can see that the sub D face has one unified face color pack. Now I'm gonna set the selection filter to none. Then I'll select the sub D and right click here to remove per face colors. Now I'll select the sub D again, hold down alt and drag to make a copy and run the tonerbs command. This time, it gives us a single open surface, which makes it easier to apply a pattern using Lunchbox in Grasshopper. But in this video, we're only using Rhino modeling techniques. I'll create a new layer and name it Backup, then create a sublayer named Surface, and move that surface to this layer. Then I'll make another layer called Sub-D, copy the Sub-D object to it, and hide both layers for, for now. Now, we're going to apply those different patterns on this sub D. I'll select the sub D and use the subdivide command. I'll press enter one more time to subdivide once more. Let's say we want to apply the pattern on this area. I'll hold down control and shift, select one face and another one, then double click between them. Then I'll select one face, double click the second to grab the full loop. I'll double click on the surface to select all related faces. Once the area where we want to apply the pattern is selected, run the extract surface command and then isolate it. Now on this sub D surface, we're going to apply our pattern. I'll go to the sub D edge ring selection tool, double click to select the vertical edge loop and press enter to finish the selection. Then I'll deselect the border edges by holding down control and shift and double clicking on the vertical border edges. Then run the named selection command and create new name selection by pressing here. And let's name it vertical edges. Then press enter. Now I'm going to use the edge ring selection tool one more time. This time I'll select all the horizontal edges press enter, 
then deselect the top and bottom parts and create a new named selection. Let's name it horizontal edges. I'll hold down Control and Shift, drag to select the entire sub D and run the inset command. In the inset options, I'll change the mode from group to single and set the inset distance to 0.1 meter. While those faces are still selected, I'll create a new named selection and call it inset. Now, if you expand the selection set, you'll see the sub D vertices, edges and faces listed separately. I'll select the sub D faces from the inset selection, then click the funnel icon to switch from face selection to the edges that the same faces touch. I'll create another name selection and call it inset edge. From the previous selection, I'll select the sub D faces and delete them. Now I'll select the inset edges, use the fill command and set the patch style to triangle fan. After that, I'll select the previous name selection and press delete. This creates a pattern. Now I'll select the vertical edges selection we created earlier and delete them as well. This gives us a lunchbox style pattern. If you want to turn this into a diamond-like pattern, just select the horizontal edges selection and delete them. Now you have a diamond style pattern, but I prefer the previous one, so I'll press Ctrl plus Z to undo those changes. Now I'll select all the faces using the select faces to boundary command and run inset again. Set the mode to single and the inset distance to 0.05, then run extract surface. This gives us the pattern we just extracted. I'll create a new layer inside the backup layer, name it pattern and move the object to that layer so we can use it later. I'll run unisolate to return to the full scene, select the pattern and the sub D and join them. It will join even on mirrored sides as well. Now we can see the join pattern clearly. I like this perforated bubbly look, but in a moment I'll show you how to create a triangular perforated pattern too. Now we'll apply the same process on this part, this part, and this part. It's the same method we used before, so you can isolate the part you need and apply the pattern directly. I won't waste your time repeating every step, so I'll speed this up. During the time lapse, let me talk to you about the tutorial series we're working on. This is part of the Rhino architectural modeling series, and it'll continue with more content like this. If you're new to the channel, we focus on architectural and parametric modeling. So if you're into that spadin, be sure to check out the rest of the channel. And if you're enjoying this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Okay, this is the pattern I just created the same way we did earlier. No new steps, just repeating the same process. I'm going to select everything and join them so it becomes one continuous geometry. It applies on each side and now we can clearly see our pattern. All right, let's, let's give it some thickness. I'll select the sub D and use the offset sub D command. Set the distance to 0.1 meter and press enter. If you're done with the modeling, you can remove the symmetry we created earlier using the remove symmetry command. And now we can clearly see our patterns. Let me show you how to get a more rigid triangular like pattern instead of the perforated bubbly one. I'll select the sub D and run the extract control polygon command. Uh, this gives us a mesh. I'll select it and move it over here so we can see it more clearly. Now you can see the result. A triangular perforation pattern, similar to what you might get from the lunchbox plugin. Okay, that's it for this tutorial. And here's a quick render I just made using the model we built so far. If you're enjoying this series, make sure to check out this video. You'll definitely find more useful modeling techniques as well. Thanks for watching and I'll see you there.